my great-grandfather and his experience in Springfield, Massachusetts. And please note that I put quote unquote around his name because, well, you'll find out later. Boy Ying in America. We don't know when he came to the United States, but I'm pretty certain that he left, returned to China in 1923. What do we know? For decades, for decades. I think the first time I heard about him was in 1970 something. My aunt had been to China and brought back his portrait, his photograph. And so we started having this conversation about who is he? He doesn't look Chinese. What, what uh, was he doing in the United States? So we know that uh, he owned a restaurant called the Canton in Springfield, Massachusetts. And what is more exciting to me is that he was almost murdered. Um, my, my father told me that probably he was killed by the Tong people because of the notorious Tong Wars that plagued Chinatown uh, in the United States in the early 20th century. My, grand, my great grandfather's daily routine was to sit at his desk in his office um, and, and to read newspaper, do whatever. So one day, a gunman entered his office holding a gun and shot at the man who was behind the desk reading a newspaper, but the newspaper shielded his face. Lo and behold, that wasn't my great-grandfather. So the gunman shot the wrong person. It was his son who died. But it happened in our family that it was the Tong struggle. And my dad said, don't you dare do research on this incident. Because if it's truly the Tongs and you uncover some detail, they might go after you. I said, okay, and uh, I actually didn't do anything about this murder until my, my father had died. Um, so he returned and tried to China in the 1920s. That was the family lore, but I have de now determined that he returned in 1923. So what are the knowns and unknowns? The restaurant, we all have the address of the restaurant. Worthing, 111 Worthington Street. We all know his real name. We have no idea what his legal name in the United States was. And why do I do this? The air quote. Well, we have to blame the Chinese Exclusion Acts, right? That was first enacted in 1882 and then renewed in 1892, which the, the Exclusion Acts were specifically designed to exclude as many Chinese men as possible from entering the United States. The women had already been banned earlier with the passage of the Page Act. So only laborers who were, had contract with them, diplomats, scholars, and merchants, which is a really amorphous category, uh, could enter legally. And uh, that those laws absolutely worked. And the number of Chinese entering the United States um, plummeted during the period of the Chinese Exclusion Act. But there was a loophole. And it, the acts generated a new industry called Paper Sun. My great-grandfather entered the United States illegally as a paper son. And that's why his name in the United States was Woi Ying. Ying is the last name. So, when did he go to Springfield? Why did he choose Springfield? And of course, the murder. Guess which question I tried to answer first. <laughs> what toolbox do I have? Ancestry.com, I pay for the pro version because it gives you information about international voyages, not just the United States. 
Newspaper.com, absolutely a must. And then oral history, uh, I don't have anyone anymore who remembered, who could tell me stories about my family's history. My mother had died, and I was freed from my obligation not to look at the murder. I decided to look at the murder. And a simple Google search revealed this. Just one page of Springfield Republican. And you can see the murder victim was identified as Ng Hong and son of Wing Sing, the proprietor of Canton. So maybe great-grandfather's name was Wing Sing? Hmm. But I needed to know more. But to know more, I had to subscribe to newspaper.com, <laughs> which was a great in investment. It allowed me to have access to uh, old newspapers around the country. And it's totally worth it. Springfield Union. I learned a lot more about this sad case. Um, this gunman, he lived in a nearby town called Greenfield. He worked in a laundry. On the day of the murder, he killed his co-worker. And then he drove to uh, Springfield, went inside into the restaurant and killed two people. And he confessed immediately. He said, yes, I killed them. Because he had his gun with him. He was apprehended. And do you know why he killed, went on this rampage? He was about to be deported to China because of violation of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he was convinced that the three people he killed had earlier promised to help him fight the deportation. And he believed that they had not worked hard enough. So out of rage, he decided to kill those three people. You can see from the headline, if he had waited one day, he would have known that the judge had found that he had not violated the Exclusion Act and he would not be deported. So he killed somebody for nothing. Um, what is impress really impressive about the newspaper accounts of the murder, and which was really sensational, was there was no hysterical descriptions. I was expecting to see stereotypes of Chinese being uh, used in the, the, in the narrative, but that wasn't the case at all. But what con I was convinced of is that this was not a Tong murder. This was just this desperate man out w not wanting to be deported to China and acted out. The picture in the bottom, that's the victim, Ng Hong and was identified as the son of Boy Ying. So now I have two names, Wing Sing or, and Boy Ying. Well, other newspaper articles about Canton Restaurant all identify the proprietor as Boy Ying. And so then I decided that must have been his legal name in the United States, which is good because once you have the name, you can go into Ancestry.com and find more information about him. But I'm a historian. I need to be convinced absolutely that my hunch is more than a hunch. I had to prove to myself that Wu Ying is indeed my great grandfather. Here's the death certificate of Ng Hong. And the name of father that I underlined in red, Ng Tui. Mon. That's the Toy San dialect rendition of his name in Cantonese would be Ng Chao Mun. But in Toy Sanese it's Ng Tui Mon. So that absolutely proved that Bo Ying was indeed my great grandfather. So I started looking at Ancestry.com because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Every ship that lands United States had to present to the immigration people a detailed manifest of all the passengers, where they came from, the birth date, and all that. So I said, well, I'll search Wu Ying now. 
nothing. But Ancestry does provide uh, copies of city directories. So I went and looked for Springfield, Massachusetts city directories, and I found many hits. I also found him listed in the census reports, and then of course Springfield newspaper, tons and tons of articles. Uh, Roy Ying was well known in Springfield, Massachusetts, and his nickname was Big Charlie. He was quite tall. I, I don't have his genes, obviously. <laughs> so this is a screenshot of, my, of a computer that all the hits from the, in the uh, Springfield directory that I found useful. The first hit was 1903. So there is some evidence that he first arrived, he might have arrived or started his own business in Springfield in 1903. He might have arrived earlier, but this was a business directory and uh, so he owned something in 1903. And then if you look down to 1923, there he was with another name. I'll come back to that later, okay? So you can see he moved around, his business moved around, but all within the same street. This is just an example of the, what the uh, city directory looked like. 1903, Boy, Ying Boy, the last name first, and then 220, 288 Worthington, 1914. Now, Canton Cafe was first mentioned. Canton Cafe, not restaurant, cafe. Yeah, there's the ad in the newspaper announcing a new and better Chinese restaurant. Attractive, unexcelled cooking. It's 1917 ad. And there have been many, many, many more ads um, appearing in the Springfield newspapers paid for by, by the Canton. So my great-grandfather really made use of uh, newspaper ads. And you note the address is 4th Street. So this was a, he already had Canton Cafe in 288 Worthington and he moved, there's a branch opening on 4th Street. And then in 1918, he probably got more prosperous. There's a newspaper announcement that he had bought property and he paid $105,000 for that. $505,000 would be over two million today. And it's a huge block. 111 to 115 Worthington. That's the ad announcing the opening. This is a photograph of the restaurant. I don't know when it was taken, but if I really want to find out, I can look at the cars, and then that will lead me to at least the date of this photograph. And what kind of restaurant was it? Not your everyday, well, not rain in Albany. It's, um, it's not a chop suey restaurant. It's not a combination of, uh, well, they didn't specialize in Americanized Chinese dishes, as you can tell from the menu here for the Thanksgiving dinner. And then, end of 1922, we have this notice that he had sold his business to a company, a group of six men, close associates, one of them being my grandfather. Here you have a really big spread about the League of Women Voters having a costume party at the Canton. Obnoxious, you know, but uh, there it is. They're, they're going, having a, an event in a Chinese restaurant. So they decided to dress like Chinese. So all the owners of Canton became famous and they got a lot of press, including this Ing going to China to attend wedding of son. This new I news item is meaningful to me because the son is my father. So this William Ng was going back to China to attend the wedding of his son. And what is interesting is, despite his juvenile appearance and the admiration that customers heaped on his, him for his wavy hair, 
William is married and has a wife and seven children in China. Wavy hair. <laughs> well, that's how descriptive. Now, so is William Ng. We, I know that William Ng is my grandfather. But how come he's called William Ng, I-N-G? So should I then use that name and go to Ancestry.com to find information? Here's his tombstone in New York, at Long Island. Hong Ming was his official name. But I know that this was a tombstone of my grandfather because of the Chinese name. So my grandfather was a paper son too. Even though his father was prosperous, they could not risk his being denied entry. So he had to find a richer man to be his father, paper father, so he could enter. 1920 in June, he arrived in San Francisco. Hong Ming, he was denied provisionally many times until August. He was admitted. So he was stranded on Angel Island for two months before he was able to gain legal entry. What happened to him? That will be another story for another time. Thank you. It's based on uh, a book called uh, Mulberry, and, uh, Mulberry and Peach by uh, Hua Ling Nie. In, in the Need for Roots, a prelude to a declaration of duties towards mankind, Simone uh, Whale states, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul, end of quote. Yet mobility and rootlessness have become increasingly the norm of human existence for many people due to voluntary or involuntary migration. According to the United States Migration Policy uh, Institute, immigrants accounted for 13% of the U.S. population in 2013. However, by February 2024, that number has increased to 15.5%. So who immigrants and what's the driving force that prompts them to make the journey to the United States? Unlike the immigrants who arrived at the beginning of the 20th century, most of the new immigrants in contemporary America are notably non-European. Chinese have migrated to different parts of the world to escape natural and human disasters and in search of alternative means of livelihood long before Europeans settled, uh, set foot on Asia. Since the arrival of three Chinese seamen in Baltimore in 1785, history has witnessed various waves of Chinese immigration to the United States, the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1892 and its subsequent extensions and appeals, the rapidly increasing population of Chinese Americans and the accelerated uh, of speed of uh, globalization. So um, we turn my attention to, uh, to the discussion of Mulberry and Peach. Winner of the 1990 American Book Award, Hua Ling Nie's novel, Mulberry and Peach, Two Women of China, was first published in 1976 in Chinese after immigration to the United States in 1964. As an already well-accomplished uh, writer in Chinese, Nia's decision to leave Taiwan was largely spurred by her painful realization she was placed under surveillance and prohibited from publishing due to her critical stance against the Taiwanese government. Nia's uh, female protagonist, Mulberry, exiled from her ancestral home in mainland China and Taiwan, her home away from home, and confronted with an alien and hostile culture represented by the man from the immigration service, suffers a mental breakdown after involuntary immigration to the United States. This mental breakdown necessarily leads Mulberry to a haunting sense of physical, psychological, cultural, and emotional displacement, and a sense of a psychological turmoil and transformation. So Mulberry splits into Peach. So Mulberry and Peach is actually the same person. So when, she's, when she was in Taiwan and China, she was Mulberry. Uh, when she's uh, in America, she becomes Peach. Um, in an interview with Nazareth, Nia reveals her nationalistic aspiration and loyalty to China and Chineseness, 
even though she has lived in the United States for about two decades at that time. She says, I still believe the writer should live in his or her own country. Since I had to live in this country, I tried harder to cope with the situation, especially with the language. Fortunately, I have to keep reading in Chinese. I have to keep writing in Chinese. Fortunately, there are Chinese anywhere in, the world, in this world. So I try to survive as a ch writer in Chinese. It is difficult. So the structural organization of her text corresponds with the displaced and fragmented identities of mulberry slash peach and the pull of the native and newly adopted cultures. The intertwined fate of mulberry and peach and other characters in Nia's text with the history of the Chinese nation is reinforced through Nia's images of com confinement and displacement throughout the text. The old man in Nia's text who represents traditional Chinese people mourns for the fate of his beloved China and the loss of his homeland to the Japanese invaders. He laments, quote, everyone has roots. The past is part of your roots and your family and your parents. But in this war, all our roots are yanked out of ground, end of quote. In part one, while the protagonist is fleeing to Chongqing with a boat full of people, their boat capsizes while crossing the dangerous waters of the Three Gorges. Though the people try hard to rescue their boat, it is stuck between the rocks until it launches downward like a wild horse set loose. The people are stranded on the rocks and remain confined there until the Japanese invaders surrender and the Chinese nation is saved. The fate of these people represents the state at a touch and go moment of suspension between survival and destruction. In part two, Mulberry is displaced and stranded in the besieged city of Beijing. The only thing she has taken with her from her home to Beijing is her grandmother's broken jade griffin. Um, Nia describes the city as a square inside a square shaped like the Chinese character return. Uh, the city inhabitants are surrounded by city walls and city gates that are closed. They have no way out and no place to return to. Uh, Nia refer informs the readers that the Chinese nat nationalists and communists are fighting and the communists are winning. In this part, the fate of China is represented by Nia's characterization of Aunt Shen, uh, Mulberry's mother-in-law, you know, who is near her deathbed. And she keeps saying, the wall of nine dragon is falling down. The wall of nine dragon is falling down. This is quite suggestive of the fall of the nationalist regime and the, and, and the decay of the traditional Chinese values. The theme of confinement and displacement continues to haunt Mulberry even after her escape to the United States. The promise the land of freedom and opportunities. Once again, Nia seems uses seemingly disjointed narratives to capture Mulberry's physical and emotional displacement and fragmented identities. Um, so throughout the text, she's confined to a small room where the man from the immigration service comes to check her identity in her room, a powerful Buddhist religious symbol, a thousand-handed Buddha, sits in the shrine enclosed by bars. Buddha's hands stretch out through the bars, but he's locked inside the shrine. So Nia questions the American promise of freedom from the illegal alien when even Buddha, Mulberry's powerful alien protector, is unable to protect himself. Forcibly exiled from war-torn China, Mulberry Peach attempts to find a sense of belonging in part three and four and a home in the United States. However, the ravages of war-torn China loom heavily in her mind. Mulberry Peach pro uh, proclaims, I'm a stranger every, uh, where, wherever I go, end of quote. For her, exile is both an internal as well as an external condition. Mulberry becomes what Bai Xianyong, who is a famous uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, writer who now uh, lives in California, uh, he calls the, the immigrants from China um, who feel rootless as wandering Chinese.
who through a uh, forced exile has no home to return to. Obviously Taiwan was under the white terror, mainland China to them was under the red terror, and in the United States, because she's, she's illegal, so she has to hide. Rootlessness has become a worldwide phenomenon. When asked by the man from the immigration service where she would um, go if she's deported, Mulberry Peach replies, I don't know. Her sense of rootlessness and homelessness is captured by Bai in The Wandering Chinese. Deprived of his cultural heritage, the wandering Chinese has become a spiritual exile. He has to move on. Like Ulysses, he sets out on a journey across the ocean, but it's an endless journey, dark and without hope. The rootless man, therefore, is destined to become a perpetual wanderer. He's a sad man. He is sad because he has been driven out of Eden, disinherited, uh, dis uh, a spiritual orphan, burdened with a memory that carries the weight of 5,000 5, years. Mulberry Peach's inability to return her to her native land and her illegal status in the United States have rendered her homeless as a result of her involuntary exile. Her sense of home and self is deeply rooted in her tormented memories of war-torn China, even as she tries desperately to derase her past through the impossible transformation of Mulberry into Peach. When asked by the immigration agent if she's loyal to the American government during an interview for her green card, Mulberry replies, I'm Chinese. And she becomes schizophrenic as she tries to sever her ties to her homeland and her past. This primitive life force that uh, Nia had mentioned urges Mulberry and Peach to redefine her sense of home in an alien land. Her flight from the, from the man from the immigration service in order to escape deportation expresses her strong will to make the United States her home. However, it also plunges her into further exile. Her illegal status and her visibly foreign appearance render her doubly exiled. She's exiled from her native land and also exiled in her adopted homeland. So I'm just going to wrap up here. I focus in the areas of gender studies and also ethnic studies. The other part I focus on, I'm a science nerd. Um, I've been interested for a while in how science and medicine um, play a role in society. So I'm looking at like social, histories, that kind of thing around medicine. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Chinese medicine, activism, and oral history. So how did I get into Chinese medicine? Um, uh, so on my mom's side, uh, like a lot of us who have Chinese immigrant um, families uh, and Chinese American communities, um, Chinese medicine is part of sort of lay practice. So like foods, for example, hot and cold, they have energetic properties. So no one in my family is actually trained in Chinese medicine, but we just know about these things and we do these kind of things when we're eating. And there's a whole host of other kind of lay practices that is just sort of like built into um, family and culture. How did I keep getting into Chinese medicine? I actually was pre-med for a while, so before I got into gender and ethnic studies, I was pre-med. I even thought about being a Chinese medicine doctor. I went to study abroad. And so I kind of kept dabbling for years. Um, and then I'll just fast forward uh, much later. Uh, we are a few years ago. Um, I had been thinking about some experiences seeing Chinese medicine practitioners in activist spaces. So that's also something I had been noticing in my own trajectory, like in nonprofit work and activist work. So it's kind of in the back of my head. Um, and so get to 2019 and I set, decide after having done other topics that I want to get into um, why is Chinese medicine pro so prevalent in activist circles. Cover art done by a friend, um, an artist activist, Corey Lin. And so she did this cover art for me um, for an article that's uh, going to be coming out. All right, so we got uh, autonomy, interconnection, so giving us a little intro. These are some themes in Chinese medicine around patients having some autonomy, um, patient self-assessment <coughs> being very important. Um, interconnection speaks to um, Chinese medicine philosophy, it thinks about person, community, trees, nature, cosmology, kind of all interconnected. And then you'll see like garlic on the top left, so that's like food medicine. Um, Ah, the people on the, those three folks are doing qigong, so that's the um, physical, mental, 
slow movement postures that folks are doing to move chi, like energy around. Um, and then top right, some ear acupuncture. A uh, person with meridian channels along the body where the chi is going. Uh, what else we have? Hands, right? Massage, there's a whole host of, of different things. Uh, oh yeah, and then, okay, so then the theme, activism, so the power fist. <laughs> I think we recognize, right, the power fist around fighting for justice, fighting against injustice. Broadly speaking, I was mentioning that I was looking at Chinese medicine and activism. So I actually started that by um, just speaking with some folks I knew from activist circles who had got burnt out, which is very common, and then they became healers doing Chinese medicine. So a bunch of the folks were Chinese Americans, but there were um, other POC, white folks, a lot of folks in spaces doing Chinese medicine. My question was, why? Okay, so in some of those discussions, so that's my larger project. I'm actually jumping us to a very specific part which speaks to today. So I wanna look, today's talk, I wanna look at how Chinese medicine was used in 60s activism. But actually, I didn't know anything about it. In my interviews with folks doing the, the practice today, they started mentioning, um, actually, the Black Panthers were using Chinese medicine. Actually, the young lords, so those are the Puerto, Puerto Rican young lords in NYC, were using Chinese medicine in the 60s. So I didn't know about that. Um, and then I became curious about that part. Okay, so that's this piece. Okay, so I'm going to zoom us out to look at the 60s um, U.S. liberation movements. So this is just like a very small, you know, few of them, Black Panther Party, etc. Um, and there's a whole host more. And you might know, um, so all of these groups, um, so Black Panthers, Black Liberation, um, focus in black communities, Young Lords is Puerto Rican, um, Asian Americans in Action, uh, Ira Kun, um, Red Guard, Asian American Political Alliance, all Asian American. There's also um, Native American, American Indian Movement, so I want to make sure to mention them. So I selected these few because these are the ones that were doing this kind of health work that I'm showing up there. So there's a whole host of things these groups were looking at all around racial justice, gender justice, class, um, fighting against empire, imperialist wars, all the issues we have today health clinics, so that was huge in the 60s. Um, Chinatown Health Clinic is the middle one, uh, and that's in New York City. Um, and then this is the Young Lords Party, uh, making demands of hospitals. So a lot of the hospitals and communities of color at the time, especially in the cities, were not um, providing health care, right? The hospitals were dilapidated, there weren't enough doctors, um, folks were also being targeted, there was a lot of violence against these communities. So a lot of this work was focused on making health care accessible and available. And also, you can imagine um, within the healthcare system a lot of racial, gender, etc. discrimination happening between doctors and patients. So all of that was a focus to take, take that back. All right, so that's the landscape, and now we can get into what's the Chinese medicine aspect. All right, so I'm gonna describe each of these things. Um, so let me lay out a couple of the characters, and then I'll get into the details. So that's Yuri Kochiyama, um, famous Japanese-American activist. Uh, Dr. Matulu Shakur, who is Black Liberation Army activist, and also um, doctor of Chinese medicine. And then we have these two on the side, which is our Lincoln Detox Center. Okay, so this scene is painting South Bronx. Um, so the community at this time in South Bronx is mostly black um, and Puerto Rican. And one of the many issues they're facing because of state targeting, state neglect, um, state surveillance, state violence, um, was heroin epidemic. And at the time, the way that they were dealing with the heroin epidemic was to get folks on methadone, so replacing heroin with methadone, which is also addictive. So in this period, this is like late 60s, um, they were looking for better ways to get folks off of heroin. And so at this time in the 70s, um, Chinese medicine is being more well known in a mainstream way in the 70s. And so these activists start hearing about acupuncture, Chinese medicine, from the mainstream press. The other player I want to mention is uh, Mao Zedong from Right China Communist Revolution. So at this time, 
groups like the Black Liberation Army, Yuri Kochiyama is part of Asian Americans in Action. They're looking around the world, they're internationalists, so they're looking at other decolonial um, movements. Black Liberation Army, Asian Americans in Action, Young Lords are looking at what Mao is doing. And so they're thinking, A, we want, we want um, to have better healthcare access. And then the second thing that happens is Mao starts talking about Chinese medicine. So he's kind of giving it rhetoric around as a very valuable medical system, Par partially like a cultural nationalist piece as well. So this also turns the tension of these activists. So, okay, let's check out Chinese medicine. So back into this picture, um, Matula Shakur, Yuri Kochiyama, they know each other. So all of these groups across the different communities of color are, are doing a lot of coalition work together. So they're in touch. So Yuri Kochiyama brings um, Matula Shakur to um, Chinatown. Uh, they get in touch with um, Chinese medicine doctors, there's also Japanese acupuncturists um, in that vicinity. And they take some of the materials and some of the treatments and then some of just research back to the South Bronx. So you have Black Liberation Army activists and Young Lords then pioneering their own program for acupuncture for detox around heroin. So it was very specific for their community. So that's the kind of work that was um, going on between communities. And the reason I focus on that piece first is that what acupuncture offered was a way to get out of a medical system that was A, giving methadone instead. And when you went to get methadone, you had to register. So there's state surveillance involved in that. Most of these groups were being surveilled, infiltrated, targeted by the FBI. So it was a way to have drug-free solutions to heroin addiction and then to get out of sort of like the governmental surveillance. So that's the East Coast part. So when I learned about all this, um, right, so far you have Yuri Kochiyama and some of the folks in Chinatown acting as kind of bridge builders um, for this new um, health system right in the South Bronx. So my question from an Asian American studies perspective was whether or not Asian American activists were also using Chinese medicine, East Asian medicine in their own um, activist work. So, Here's the interesting part where, so I start looking into the archives, I look at Asian Americans in Action, that Chinatown Health Cl uh, Clinic, a bunch of stuff going on in New York City around Asian American activists, and I don't really find anything with Chinese medicine. Um, and so there's an interesting part I want to add around doing archival research for groups that were so heavily under surveillance. So a lot of their documents, their names, their records were not kept on purpose because the FBI, FBI is surveilling them, they don't want to keep all those records. So then I turn to oral histories. So that's the other focus of my talk today. So oral histories are a really good way um, to get history that's not written down. Um, and so it's a type of interview where you get a person's life story and you're taking them as the expert of their own story. A lot of these um, elder activists uh, have passed, some have survived, so I was able to talk to a few of them. And so as I talked to the folks in New York City, they ended up um, referring me to folks on the West Coast, so now I'm going to jump to the West Coast. A lot of the other groups, like Black Panther Party's national, right? Um, but Asian American Political Alliance was a Berkeley-based, a Berkeley, California-based group. And so here we just have a couple quick images of, um, I'm just going to say APA is the shorthand, APA group, and then Sifu Bryant Fong. So he's an activist, a martial artist, and a lay martial arts medicine person. So he's the primary interview oral history I'm going to tell you about today and what I learned from him. I mentioned he had three things, so here's where I want to also talk about this relationship between Chinese medicine and martial arts. Um, so there's it seems very opposite in one way, but the Chinese philosophy bridges both. So they both have extreme knowledge of the body, right? One is healing, one is for fighting. Um, but the philosophical frameworks have quite a, quite a lot of overlap. But I want to mention that there's overlap between the medicine and the martial arts, which actually led to this other phenomenon that the martial arts ended up carrying 
the medicine while it was being criminalized. So let me zoom out. Uh, my other colleagues talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act. So you all know probably right Chinese folks, other Asians, other POC um, have been criminalized, excluded right throughout history. So two, there's so much to say about it, but one right Chinese Exclusion Act is to, was really to keep keep um, the white majority right numerically. That's part of it. Um, they didn't want Chinese families to settle. That's one piece, demographics. But the other piece was the labor, right? So white communities want to monopolize the labor force. Um, and that labor force includes Chinese doctors. And then add another layer that, um, so in these periods like 1880s, right, those exclusion periods, um, through the early 1900s is when what we call Western medicine or allopathy or biomedicine was coming into its strength. So to do that, it had to eliminate other threats. So as part of the exclusion and criminalization of Chinese people, alongside that was the criminalization of Chinese medicine. This is two things from the 1870s. Um, and I, was it Vivian, you were saying, yeah, unlike yours, these are very clearly, if you just look at the wording, like quacks, those are referring to Chinese medicine doctors, that's 1870s. Credulous patients, right? Um, there's a lot of funky language if you look into it. Asiatic stages, a bunch of stuff. Um, but the point is they're being criminalized, you see the legal language. Uh, it goes up and down, this criminalization and surveillance, but I want to put us forward to 1970s, right, the period I'm talking about, um, and it's the same thing. Not as bad language, but Chinese medicine, um, doctors, particularly acupuncturists, are getting arrested. So this is a period that activists are working under. So this also means that Chinese doctors doing Chinese medicine are being criminalized in the 70s. So it's hard for activists, Asian American, Asian -American activists, who are also being surveilled right, to do all that work. So this is where we get back into martial arts as a carrier and a cover for Chinese medicine. Most uh, Kung Fu, so this is like Chinese martial arts uh, masters, Kung Fu masters do know, something about uh, do know something about medicine because as I was mentioning, the philosophy, uh, Chinese philosophy covers both. Chinese medicine, martial arts, philosophy are actually overlapping and part of a, a larger system. I'll give you one example. Um, tai Chi is a really good example. Tai Chi is actually a martial art foremost. Um, but it has, as many of you probably know, a lot of health benefits, right? So even then, that was, it was always doing both things. In the U.S., it's more of a health thing, it seems to me, but originally it was a martial art with health benefits. So that's an example of that overlap. So a Tai Chi practitioner who sees himself as a martial art artist is also able to cultivate their own health, right, and lead other people into cultivating health. So that's part of the martial artists, um, medical aspects. So it's already together in that way. Then thinking about um, Chinese medicine, Asian American activism uh, in, I'll go back actually, just so we have that. Back to this scene, right? How is it playing a role? Um, so interviewing uh, Sifu Bryant Fong, he, his master, his Sifu is George Long. So George Long was, um, primarily a martial artist doing White Crane, and he was teaching martial arts to Asian American activists, Black Panthers, a lot of the activists. So there's the other piece, is that martial arts itself had a really strong role in Asian American and other activism in the 60s, because they were literally training themselves physically in self-defense um, with police and whoever. Physically, and then back to the multiple aspects of, of martial arts, there's the mental, there's the spiritual, there's the philosophical part. So a lot of activists, um, Asian Americans and others, were using martial arts as a way to cultivate mental discipline, like uh, mental strength, right, in the face of constantly fighting against injustice. So that already had a feature to it, um, to, to the activist circles. Um, and then they were also getting treated by their martial arts teachers in medicine, and some of them were getting trained in Chinese medicine as well. So all of that, um, what I am looking at still is how martial arts served as a way to, to preserve uh, Chinese medicine when it was being criminalized. 
Uh, I will say other places, you can't stamp out any medicine. So there was also, for example, in Chinatown, um, medicine practitioners in the period going underground. Right, so do, treating communities in Chinatown, but the communities in Chinatown are not always the same as the activist community. So there was a disconnect there as well. Okay. All right, um, all right, this is my last slide. All right, so this is just my wrap up. Um, again, pivoting us like, so I'm looking at martial arts, Chinese medicine, activism all together. So what is the role that Chinese medicine and martial arts is playing in activism? One, as I said, um, these communities were underserved just like other POC communities. So just not having access to mainstream medicine, Chinese medicine was a way um, to get health care of some kind. So the other piece, of course, is Chinese medicine. If you're Chinese American or East Asian medicine, if you're East Asian, it's a cultural, uh, cultural value point. So Bryant Fung, um, Chinese medicine was important because we did see it as part of ourselves, it was part of our culture, one way of healing that Western medicine or Western science didn't think was valid and we felt it was something that we could contribute, that we'd be different from what we're there actually doing and actually have some real effect. Making contact with China allowed us to see that that was really true, so it became part of the Asian movement." End quote. So that's part of like the cultural pride piece that's also important um, in these fights for, for justice. The important pieces around Chinese medicine is that because it does physical, mental, spiritual, and philosophical, it does offer things like how do you do drug-free treatment right, of addiction. That's not something you get in Western medicine. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things, tapping, pai da, um, qigong itself, like cultivating your qi. These are ways to hit like physical, mental, spiritual, philosophical all at once. So these are some of the things that it, it offers I wanted to highlight. Really important to be valuing, right, these parts of any of our communities, right, our heritages, um, our traditions that have so much value, but they're in mainstream society devalued. Like something like Chinese medicine is very much devalued compared to Western medicine, biomedicine, allopathy. Um, and it's devalued, criminalized, it's also stolen and plundered from, right? All of these things we wanna push back against. So I'll leave with you with that, thank you.